Hello, Ray. We are live. Thank you for coming. It's so good to have you. Thank you, Sarah. All right. Everybody, thank you so much for uh, turning in. We are so happy that you are here with us. And today we are going to um, to introduce you to another another episode with Rick Road. So I'm going to introduce him briefly so you know a little bit about him and he will introduce himself. So today our presenter is a 10 time nonfiction book author and an authority on American history. He spent most of his adult life living aboard boats and has traveled far and wide in America. So let us welcome Rick Rhodes. Thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. Thank you for um, being with us. And um, we are going to, um, to talk about your book. But before we get there, Tell us, tell our audience a little bit about you. About me? Well, geez, I'm in, uh, uh, well, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in South America and an uh, army officer, which was a strange combination, but I did that. I was in the service. I was an instructor and I have a graduate degree from Virginia Tech and an undergraduate from West Virginia. And I worked in, uh, North American Free Trade Agreement and speak a little bit of Spanish. And I lived aboard boats, as you said, most of my life. And I sailed to Central America and Cuba and a few other places. And I have an affinity for that area. And I started out writing boating guidebooks. I wrote nine of them and they were pretty well received. And I mean, 10 book was something different with the national market uh, on American history. People love the history in my boating guidebooks. So I said, well, I'll just write a history book of people I know from my boating guide books and more people that I know because I read a lot of history. My last book, I read 100 books to put this one together. And one of the stories we're going to hear about today is Mother Mary Jones. So you know, want me to start or you want to preface um, this? Yeah, just uh, give me one minute. I, I got too excited and I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> Well, we can have that. <laughs> <laughs> I now. Yes, I mean, we, we jump start real fast. So, um, in case you never met me, I'm Sarah M. I'm an, also an author. And my book is called How I Survived the Killing Fields. I, yes, I did. I survived that. Um, that experience back in Cambodia, but um, I'm not here to talk about my book. I'm here to to tell you about Rick and about his amazing book, the book of history. And I, I feel like everybody deserves to know a little bit about this book. And with that in mind, I just want to show you the picture quickly this is um, his banner Rick Road and his um, Facebook well his um, his website is rickroad.com and the book that he's going to talk about is they made America great so that's what we are going to talk about today so let's get back to the show Okay. Thank you, Sarah. We have one thing in common, though. Well, we have more than one thing because I've lived in the third world, too, but we've all got malaria and it nearly wiped us out. You got it in Cambodia. I got it in Ecuador, and I was pretty close to, you know, meeting the maker there, too. So we've both been through that experience, and not, we don't want to do, to do it again. I know why you survived Cambodia. You loved your parents so much. You wanted to see them again, and that was a great story. And today I'm going to talk about... Uh, Gosh, Mother Mary Jones. I don't know how to preface her. She lived in, she was born about 1830s and lived almost 100 years to the 19th. She died in 1930. She was born in the 1830s. And she was not born in this country. One of the few people in my book that was not actually born in America, but she was an American. Uh, my phone's ringing here. I'll turn the damn darn thing off. 
Uh, but she, her, her, she came. She was she came from Cor County Cork, Ireland, and her grandfather and her father were. They didn't like the way the British were treating the Irish, which was pretty badly. And her father was outspoken, and her grandfather was outspoken. Her grandfather was hanged, and her father was about to be hanged for being a, a loud mouth, speaking about the poor, the plight of the working poor. And he escaped to North America, first to Toronto and then the United States. And eight years later, he was able to bring the rest of his family, his wife and his three daughters, the oldest being Mary Harris. Her name was Mary Harris, which we know as Mother Jones. And uh, eventually, they, Mary, Mary Harris settled in Memphis. She was a school teacher, and she was really appalled at the horrible conditions school teachers were getting. This was back in the 1850s, and eight, yeah, 1850s. And, and does that sound familiar today? You know, we don't, uh, school teachers are much underappreciated. They do a, a tremendous amount of important work for the country. And that was the same, case, wait, same way in 1850. Well, so she quit that, and she was skilled at also dressmaking. So she went down to Memphis, Tennessee, and met her future husband, George Jones, where she got the name Mary Jones, and uh, took up uh, dressmaking and started a family. And within seven years, well, George was less like her, her father and her grandfather. He was kind of an agitator, too. He spoke up for union rights and was a steel mill worker in Memphis. And... Uh, he did. He spoke up. We need better conditions for the working poor, as we say. And long story short, uh, within seven years after arriving in Memphis, George died in an industrial accident, and all four of her young children died of smallpox. At 37 years old, Mary Jones was all by herself and quite distraught, as any person would be. But what did she do in her pain and her anguish? She didn't. She didn't fall in for self-pity. She went out to help other people in the smallpox. And that was her saving grace. And how many of us, when something tragically strikes, we look at self-pity? And she was not one to do that. She went out and, and took her life. It had fallen apart as worse as it possibly could, except dying. And she did good things for other people. Well, eventually she moved to Chicago, Illinois. And she started her... She, she, went back to her dressmaking business and started making dresses for rich people in Chicago on the south side of Chicago. And uh, see, there's a lot of people living in hovels back then in Chicago, like holes in the ground and not much more really awful houses. And the rich people would walk right by them and couldn't care less. And this burned Mother Jones. She says, yeah, how can you rich people, you see these poor people, you come from Cambodia. I lived a lot in Latin America and I saw these conditions. And it kind of burned me too. And but if you've lived in in a gone to a third world country and not lived in a fancy motel, stayed there and went around the streets, you would still see some of this today and get an appreciation for it, as you know and I have, about those conditions. And this was this was in the country right after the Civil War. Well, so Mother Jones is doing this, and she's mad at the rich people. It's still making a lot of money. And then in 1871 in Chicago, there was something called the Great Chicago Fire. You might have heard it from history. 300 people were killed. 100,000 people lost their homes. And Mary Jones, again, lost everything. She was living in a soup kitchen. I mean, here this woman is just attacked by one thing. No, no good fortune by one thing after another. And, and she was like one night in the soup kitchen, and she was volunteering, doing everything she could for other people that lost their homes in Chicago. And she went to, there was a union meeting of, of textile workers downstairs that tried to organize. And she went and said, well, come on, Mary, go, join the meeting tonight. And she said, okay. So she went to the meeting and what she heard really resonated. She said, you know, these people are onto something. This is not today. This is 1870s, United States, the robber baron era, the Gilded Age. But the poor people were very poor. This is before Teddy Roosevelt got in there and started, you know, doing a lot of things to straighten up America's poor working class conditions. And that's, that's the oversimplification of what went on. But anyway, that's, that was the conditions in America. The Gilded Age, the rich were very rich, the poor were very poor. And Mother Jones did not like that. And she went to this labor union meeting in a soup kitchen in Chicago after the fire. 
And she said, this is, this is, this is for me. I'm going to help these people for the next 50 years. She did not have a home. She was always on the road, helping children, helping minors, helping textile workers, helping railroad workers, and many others. She traveled and did not have a home. So this is what she did. She found her passion and speaking out for labor. And she was, she was good. She wore a bonnet, but she could cuss with the best of them. And it's a picture of her usually wearing a bonnet, but she was, she was a feisty lady. She called her the grandmother of all agitators. And, uh, she did a lot of good stuff. She, there were laws on the books that were never enforced state and federal. She got to them and, and did, did many, many things to help these people. The song shall be coming around the mountain when she comes was probably attributed to Mary Jones work speaking out for the coal miners in West Virginia. She did a lot for coal miners and, and uh, Chicago, not Chicago in Colorado, the coal mining industry was horrible. They were, they were many times more debts in Colorado coal mines than they were elsewhere in the country. And uh, there was uh, 1914 in April. There's a lot leading up to this. The, the coal miners in Colorado were, were on strike. They said, this is terrible. You know, we have, this is the year of the company store. We have the old mine sold to the company store, a great song. But the people had to buy chips from the company store, and they, they could never get out of poverty. They, the company held them in internal poverty in their families. So they could go on strike, and then the company companies did not like that. The owners did not like that, so they hired private detective agencies. One of the most notorious ones was called Baldwin Phelps, and they were around for about 40 years. You seemed to learn, learn nothing. But anyway, in Ludlow, Colorado in 1914, the miners were on strike, and the Baldwin Phelps detective and the Colorado militia, both hired by the owners of the coal mines, opened fire with a machine gun on this tent camp of workers. And they killed like 20 people, innocent. 12 of them were women and children. And horrible situation. And Mother Jones was called onto the scene, and she talked to the owner of the mine, John B. Rockefeller Jr. And uh, that's kind of a long story, but I'll tell you more about it if you want. But anyway, long she, she, after that, Baldwin Phelps never learned their lesson. They were not, they were not nice people. Uh, um, a couple of years later, there was a movie about something in West Virginia called Metawan. It was also a problem with coal mines and the Hatfield. I didn't, one of the Hatfields and the Hatfield McCoys was involved in that. A year later, I bet no one ever heard of the Battle of Blair Mountain. It was a union, and the and a military and the miners strikes and ball went fellas again and they used helicopters to attack the miners they shot 100 people this is in the united states in west virginia my state that i have much affiliation with so we weren't all that we were cracked up to be and mother jones was always on the forefront speaking out for that and, you know she was called the most dangerous woman in america but at a time when that needed to be said today that you know that we don't have that labor problem but living in South America and you living in Cambodia, we can see some of the abuses that the rich did to the poor. And Mother Jones spoke to that. And uh, anyway, when she passed away, oh, I think it was 1930, uh, she had on her tombstone, uh, she gave her life to labor. I think I have it here. It, it, it's very good. Uh, it was, she buried outside of St. Louis and she wanted to be buried with coal miners who were killed in the union strike about 30 years prior and on her tomb it says she gave her life to the world of labor her blessed soul to heaven god finger touches her and now she sleeps so we you know there's a there's a i think mother jones diary or mother jones magazine or something it's kind of pro-labor and stuff like that and she was called a socialist in her time but in those days we needed some social responses to what was happening in the industry uh and 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 she was she served a place probably today she would not be well received but she was received well then i think of her the mother Teresa of north america in many regards she went with the poorest of the poor after all those bad things happened to her she was able to basically uh gain, you know uh, address them and she she was she was effective she, laws that were on the books to protect the union to protect people became enforced in those days two million children were working in the mines and many of them were working 16 hour days uh seven days a week uh and they had missing limbs and who could care less and mother jones thought that that, that uh, 
working men should have a decent enough salary to support their wife and their children so the children wouldn't have to work neither with the wife. She was also a bit of an advocate for women's rights, which is we and a woman's right to vote was the nineteenth amendment and Mary Jones lived long enough to see that pass in nineteen twenty. So she did a lot of good stuff. She was ahead of her time. She's kind of a forgotten hero, in my opinion, and did so much for women, minors, and the displaced people in, uh, in, in living at that time. And I probably have a lot I didn't say. But anyway, if you have some questions for me, I'll be happy to answer them, Sarah. Okay, perfect. So thank you for that uh, brief history of what an amazing woman. She was. She is. Yeah. So I'm going to um, show her picture before I ask you a question. Is that okay, Rick? Absolutely. She's not wearing a bonnet in that picture. <laughs> yeah. So this is her picture. Sorry, I missed that. Could you say it again? Sorry. Siri heard my talk and she. <laughs> okay. This is the picture of, of uh, Mother Jones. So she's, she's an amazing person. Wow. Yeah, why don't you get cuss? Yeah, she is awesome. I, uh, yeah, I have some question for you. So maybe, um, if if the audience have any question, please sure. please put your question. We will um, we will reach out to you. So, what drew you to choose Mother Joan for your tenth nonfiction book? Well, what did I pick? Gosh darn, I wrote that down. Why did I pick Mother Jones? Uh, oh, that age, 18, 18, is right after the Civil War, the robber barons, the Gilded Age. There's not many people, much, I didn't know much about that period in American history. And Mother Jones did her, her good deeds in that. So with that period, kind of, I knew a little about it, so I want to learn more about it. And I found a hero of Mother Jones. Who was around that period so it's basically that time in american history before world war one after the civil war during before well, this was actually during the spanish american war time it's a time uh, you know the very rich were doing very well the vanderbilts the melons uh the carnegie or excuse me carnegie and a few other people the robber barons were you know the johnstown flood happened then and that's another example of what happened during this time. So that, that time in American history kind of fascinated me because I knew very little about it. And sure as heck, I found Mother Jones. Oh, awesome. And um, I have another question. What did you especially like about Mother Jones? Boy, she did something I never could do. If I get bad news or something, I'm in the self pity and all like, why did this happen to me? Oh, my, my, my why me? Why me? Well, this lady did not do any of this. She did the opposite. What we shall, more of us should strive to do. She's, she lost her husband. She lost her home. She lost her four children. And she, I'm sure she went through some period of, of, of grief. And, you know, why why me? You know, I didn't, I don't deserve it. But she, instead, she looked out. She, instead of looking at herself, she looked at the needs of other people. And to me, that's that's what Mother Teresa did. That's what so many great Christians have done. They have not looked inward at, like, why is this happening to me? They looked outward. And that's what really attracted me to her. She's really a great woman because she was able not to focus on herself, but to focus on others. Mm. Awesome. So uh, I have another question. Are there any lessons we can learn, we can draw today from Mother Jones' life? Absolutely. Absolutely. Just this past week, there was somebody named Liz Cheney who was speaking, who was going out on a limb to say certain things because she morally believed it was correct. And she lost a lot. And Mother Jones lost a lot. So Mother Jones spoke out sometimes for unpopular causes, unpopular issues. And it did not make her a lot of friends sometimes. But it was the right history proved it was the right thing to do. As I think today, you know, we need people to speak out when they see things wrong and injustice. And Mother Jones was willing to do that. And that's a really important lesson. I mean, you know, God created only you and me, and we are, have a certain set of attributes. And, you know, Mother Jones knew she was a hellraiser in a certain way, one side of her, and she surely was. 
You know, she was an old lady. Two guys tried to mug her. She hit her over the head and, and got away. So, so she she was unique in in regards that things didn't go her way. She still fought it, and she tried to do things. And people today should use their God given brain, their talent to see what's right and what's wrong, and fight it, even though it's not the popular thing, like Mother Jones did. Hmm. Awesome. Thank you for that answer. Wonderful. So um, my other question is, is uh, tell us more about the exchange between Mother Jones and John D. Rockefeller Jr. after well, the Ludlow, uh, Colorado massacre. Yeah, this is real interesting. That happened in 1914. And, uh, and they were like 20 people initially killed mostly women and children after that and it was more than that many times more and all the mother jones was already well known in 1914 and they told her you got to see the owner of that mine john d rockefeller jr his father was a one of the original robber barons at standard oil of ohio and so she said okay i'll see john d rockefeller he was up in new york city and uh, and said so you give him hell and you 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 know and and she went up there and she was ready to give him hell and she started talking to him, and he said, look, I'm sorry what happened in Ludlow. It's really bad. I apologize. I can only do so much to repair. It. I can't bring lives back. And she softened on the guy, you know. She, and then people didn't like Mother Jones. Why'd you do that? Usually giving the, the guy hell, and she probably did in some way. But Rocker, but sometimes it doesn't behoove us to give somebody hell. And Rockefeller, and she thought Rockefeller honestly felt very bad about that. And he probably really did. And guess what Rockefeller did? He became a philanthropist. And then we have the Rockefeller Center. We have the Rockefeller. So sometimes your enemy, when you want to crucify him or not, she smart enough to realize not to do that. And it actually had a better effect for overall good in the coming decades, in the coming century. Rockefellers are noted philanthropists now. Thank you for Mother Jones not putting the screws on the guy when everybody was telling her to do it. So in spite of her being a hellraiser and whatever you want to call her, she also had enough sense to gauge the situation and say, you know, this Rockefeller guy, yes, he owns the mine in Ludlow and many others across the country, but it's not all his fault. They got Baldwin Phelps and the Colorado militia probably had more culpability in that incident than anybody. And Rockefeller was like, I'm sorry it happened. And had she pressed Rockefeller hard like everybody wanted to do, he might have not become the great philanthropist he was to become. So that's a lesson there, a little lesson like when you're when you're pushing people you don't like or pushing your enemies, give them, an, and we learned this in the military, give them a route of escape. Don't, don't, don't give them, don't, the most dangerous thing is to take somebody and corner them and tell them you can't, don't leave a, a graceful way to get out of it. And then she did leave against the advice of everybody around her, she left Rockefeller graceful way out. And guess what? He became a great philanthropist. So mm -hmm. great story. And within yeah. a story. Yeah. So I saw her in her picture. It showed that she was born in 1830 to, and she lived until 1930. Is that correct? She died in 1930. We're not sure when she was born. Some say, she, 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 some say 1837, some say 1830. She, I think late in her life, she was trying to make herself older than she was. Like, I lived to be 100 years old. I should be born in 1830. But some say she was born in 1837. So she, if you say she was born in the 1830s, you got it right. So <laughs> she, lived in the, she lived into her 90s. Whether she made it to 100 or not is questionable. She she played around with her age like a lot of people did back then. You know? Yeah, good question. Hi. <laughs> well, I don't have any other question for you, but uh, she, yeah, her her life is very interesting, and it's a, uh, you know, it's I feel very humble to yeah. have heard her story like that. If you have any other questions in the check box, let me know. I'll I'll be happy to answer them. Yeah, nobody <laughs> asked any questions, so you must have done a good job. Well, as always, <laughs> I don't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you, the audience, if you did not catch this live show, you can always watch the replay. You can always ask questions. We will check from time to time to see if we have any questions. But you can.
find Rick's book, I put his website on the screen. It's scrolling. It's uh, rickroad.com. So feel free to visit his website and support him because um, you you support a, a, an author who spent a lot of time mm -hmm. researching the wonderful people in our history that made America great. So um, it's a good topic. It's a good book. So I hope you you reach out <laughs> and um, order one. It's on Amazon as well. But um, if you get it from him directly from the website, you might get the autograph copy. I don't know. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and if you want to personalize the autograph, just tell me and I'll do it. <laughs> I always personalize. I always autograph my book when people order from my website. So talking about website, yeah, you see uh, Rick's uh, website is scrolling on the screen. I just want to show my my information real quick in case people want to reach out to me, in case you want to be featured on this, this uh, platform. This is the beginning. I did not plan to do this, but I just feel the urge of helping uh, Ray to, you know, to share about his wonderful book. Why not? So I just um, do this, <laughs> and uh, because I I know Ray and I know that he spent a lot of time, and uh, this is a, a book that people need to know about it. So um, I will share my contact information on the screen right here. You can take a quick look and you can take a, a, a picture of it and you get my my website, my email and my phone number. So feel free to reach out if I can support you in any way. And I will put by Rick's banner so you can see his banner. So we will hang out a few more minutes. And if you have any questions, please, please, please put it in the chat. Put it in the, in the comment. We will, we will be able to see it right now as we are live. But once we get offline, we cannot uh, see. So I see that Rani is watching and we see some uh, uh, a like sign. So thank you. Thank you, Rani. Thank you everyone for watching. If this is, um, this is good for you to watch, we would love to do it again so next week you can turn it turn on and we can do it again next week the same time so let me take the banner off so we can say goodbye <laughs> so our time is up so i just want to say thank you for watching whether you are watching now on live or you watch later on a replay you can review this on a replay anytime on my website on not on my website on my facebook platform uh, sarah m a speaker author and in the group we have a group that featured this show it's called cpn it stands for christian professionals network Tampa bay and it's also show on my YouTube channel. Today I put it on YouTube. You know, my YouTube is not as organized as I want to, but um, as I have something, I just put it there. So hopefully, people get a chance to watch it. Other than that, we will sign off and say goodbye for now. And thank you again for watching. See you again next week, Thursday the same time at two o'clock. Thank Bye. you all, Sarah. Yeah.